So the session all of you have been waiting for, everybody's here, so we are going to start. Literature was the cinema influence and in shaping beauty idols. We have Javed Akhtar, Shashi Tharoor, Anuja Chauhan, Nandana Snein, Mary Brenna, and they will be in conversation with Shama Chaudhary. The session is presented by Da. So do you like your hair? No. You don't like your hair? I want my hair to be straight because when you have your hair straight, it's really smooth. Do you think that's more beautiful? Yeah. Does it really feel good to have curly hair? I try to make it straight, but it doesn't work. Yeah, I try to do this, but it doesn't work. Sometimes I just wish I could do it just for me. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. I think um, about my hair that I, so. I don't want it anymore. Yeah. That feeling makes me sad sometimes. When I leave out my hair. I was explaining that it took us all this time to make it. That's very nice. Asked to stand up and take one picture, uh, and then we'll start the session. So do bear with us. Yeah, this is the power of social media. <laughs> Thank you. I think, I think they've got their pound of flesh. Yes, I think so. <laughs> okay. Hello. How many people do you think are here? Good afternoon again. 1500, 2000. And thank you for coming to this session on ideas of beauty in cinema and literature. But I just wanted to say that this is not only a discussion about aesthetics, but a discussion about oppression and tyranny and real life impacts. The global industry today is worth almost $300 billion and in India it's worth about 80,000 crores and most of that is fueled by high doses of self-disgust, low self-esteem, not just aspiration but sheer biological absurdity. I'm not even sure whether we should call it ideas of beauty anymore because it has become so homogeneous. Uh, ideas of beauty have got divorced from culture, from geography, from racial types, from food, uh, you know, from variety. There's only a homogeneous economy of sameness. So today we'll be discussing what's driving those ideas of beauty, how we're all victims of it, whether cinema and literature affects those ideas of beauty, or indeed whether commerce is, is really driving what cinema and literature now uh, speak of as beauty and also alternative ideas of beauty, whether that's at all possible. To discuss that, we have a very varied and uh, you know, preeminent pre panel. There's Javed Saab, uh, of course, who needs no introduction.
and who of course will be able to give us an understanding of the turning point in cinema when the old ideas of beauty which were associated with qualities and personality became merely a body type. He's looking very perturbed, so I'm not going to start with him first. Uh, Nandana Devsen, an activist, uh, actress and uh, a writer. Nandana, I picked this up from the internet, so I'm not sure whether it's correct, but apparently somebody asked her for her vital statistics and she said she was 35, 25, 36. This is what's there on the internet. Uh, and so I'm going to discuss that with her. Shashi Tharoor, of course, a polymath. And And I'm going to ask Shashi for ideas of beauty in the South and why the South is so obsessed with ideas of fairness. Some of his political capital comes from looking the way he does. You know? <laughs> My vital statistics, 7 for 39 in a cricket match. <laughs> <laughs> Mari Brenner, investigative journalist, writer, uh, you know, a writer at large with Vanity Fair. Uh, again, a, a voice, an ambassador, and perhaps a dissenter of the ideas of beauty that the West is, uh, uh, you know, really exporting to us. And Anuja Chauhan, writer, award-winning writer, also an advertiser. And I'm Shoma Chaudhary, editor of Catch News. So, I'm, uh, Javid Sab, I'm going to come back to you in a bit to ask you about which point in cinema ideas of beauty, in Hindi cinema ideas of beauty change. But let me start with each of you quickly. Nandana, if you would go first. Uh, some idea of beauty that, uh, you know, has oppressed you in your life, that you've tried to live up to, some honest moment from your life. Uh, and, and also what you would deem to be your uh, conception of beauty. Well, an honest moment in which I've felt um, oppressed is uh, this reference of having given my vital statistics, which I have no memory of. If those were ever my vital statistics, it must have been many, many, many years ago, but I do not ever remember giving that quote. In fact, I usually, I have been asked this question many times, and I usually have uh, very clear, evasive uh, answers. But um, I think uh, the, um, yeah, so you, can you hear me now? All right. Um, I think in my lifetime, uh, they were, speaking of the film industry or popular culture in India, there were always two parallel ideals of beauty. So I grew up with Himama Lili and Rekha, but I also grew up with Shabana Azmi and uh, Smita Patel. And I think this trend has continued. Uh, you know, so when there was uh, the Karina, Karishma, and uh, um, Ravina, there's also been Nandita Das, there's also been a taboo. Uh, one of the things that I find is not so oppressive right now is that there is, uh, even though the top actresses are still all very thin and very fair skinned and very straight haired, there are actresses like uh, Vidya Balan and there are actresses like Kangana Ranawat who are reducing this kind of polarization, this polarized definition of beauty, and this gap is decreasing, I feel. Um, I feel Nandana, uh, you know, the thing that we probably have to be honest about is that possibly Vidya Balan's body type is not the aspirational body type that we're all, uh, you know, aspiring to. And that's, that's a kind of gap that I'd like us to discuss. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, Shashi, as I said, I first wanted each of us to give our vital statistics, not in the physical sense, but to give your conception of beautiful. You know, can you pick a character from a film or from writing that you deem as the idea of beauty? Well, first of all, actually, one of the important distinctions between beauty in literature and in cinema is that in cinema, Unfortunately, nothing is left to your imagination. You actually have an actress and she represents the character. Whereas in literature, you can imagine the beauty that the author is seeking to depict. And very often, different readers of the same book may have a totally different conception of what the, act, the, the character in the book looked like. Uh, because apart from a few clues, 
by and large, there's a limit to how precise a description can be. In cinema, you're stuck with the actress you've got. Uh, that's the first thing, and I, I, I say this uh, entirely conscious. Two, just two more quick points. The second is that, yes, there has been a significant change in what is considered beautiful in Hindi cinema, uh, in Bollywood and in general. I would say it's, it's, it's still not entirely true in all of regional cinema, at least speaking as, as a South Indian, though it's catching up. And that is that the principal change relates to our own changes as a society in attitudes to fitness. I mean, you look at some of the heroes and heroines of the 60s. Um, I mean, some of the heroes have lost the Battle of the Bulge long before it was fought. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're all sort of pleasantly going to seed, but that doesn't prevent them from romancing the heroine. Uh, the heroines themselves are usually fairly generously proportioned. Um, and and one, one sort of grew up in a idealizing with like a Muntaz, I'm a different generation, sorry. But the point is, there were actresses who, um, who were, uh, shall we say, uh, I, I took paraphrase Woodhouse, they had more curves than a scenic railway. Uh, but, but the fact is that that was considered beautiful. Today, uh, and I've now been able to meet some of these actresses off screen, and they're frighteningly thin. Uh, and I say frighteningly. Uh, it, it, it really it helps. I mean, I, it's even worse for some of the Hollywood actresses one meets because they are almost emaciated uh, for all practical purposes. And I'm not even sure that's entirely healthy. But that seems to now be the aspirational type, to use your phrase. And that's the, that's the thing. Uh, and the third and final thought is, is, is we always seem to assume that beauty refers to female beauty. But uh, some of the perceptions of male beauty are also significantly changing. Uh, first of all, there was a time when you had a lot of South Indian actresses in North Indian films, but never saw a South Indian actor. Um, and to this day, it's relatively uncommon, but at least there are one or two who have been able to break through. Uh, there's something there about Indian attitude, about Indian attitudes to body type, facial features, uh, moustaches or lack thereof, uh, etc which I think uh, needs further pausing as the conversation goes on. Yeah. I'm going to come back to the discussions of size zero. We haven't even got into fairness, which is another yeah. issue. So I was just going to say, I'm going to come back to size zero and fairness later. I was trying to map your landscapes of beauty, which none of you have so forth, uh, you know, Muntaz you mentioned. None of us wants to incriminate us. None of you want to incriminate. mention two women who I think are two of the most beautiful women working in the film industry now. So That's they, true. They are, they are I think all women are beautiful, Shama. <laughs> Shashi. <laughs> Shashi, when you stop being the politician, be the writer right now. <laughs> I, I, had a, I wanted to respond to one thing that he said uh, about when we were talking about literature and film. Um, I agree with what you said, of course, but I find it uh, fascinating that when a female character gets translated from literature into cinema, uh, very often beauty becomes the most pro prominent uh, characteristic, even if that was not the case in the way the character had been conceived by, uh, by the author. And going back to what you said about different, uh, to both of you said about different parts of the world, uh, of India, I mean, Pado, for instance, has, uh, Pado from Devdas has appeared in multiple languages all over India, but every time she has been played by the one who was considered most beautiful uh, in that time, whether it was Suchitra or Aishwarya, though Pado's love with uh, Devdas had nothing to do with her beauty. beauty. Yeah. I'm going to come back, Nandana, uh, to everybody. I just want to draw everyone into the conversation. Speaking about fairness and male constructs of beauty, Let's go to Jesus Christ, you know, who's really from the Middle East and why he looks uh, blonde and Caucasian and so fair is itself another discussion, you know, when he well could have been British or, or black. So we'll come back to that. Uh, Javid Saab, uh, if you don't look so menacing, I'll ask you a question, <laughs> which is to really help us understand Hindi cinema. You know, uh, Nandana mentioned Mumtaz, Nargis, with none of them, and in fact I was thinking about Shole, the big film of all time, and I remember that scene when Hema Malini is running after the cart, and you never notice their bodies, you notice personality, you notice ephemeral qualities, fem you know, feminineness, but never their bodies. At which point did that rupture happen in Hindi cinema, when all our idea of beauty has now become the body, rather than the personality? Well, first of all, let's not take literature or cinema as a monolith. 
there are different kind of cinema and there are different kind of literature and there are different kinds of ideas of beauty so it is not cinema has this idea of beauty and literature has that idea of beauty that is not right first of i mean the major thing that happened was somewhere in 70s for the first time two leading ladies came who were not confirming the image one and they were almost on the opposite side of the spectrum why almost of course on the opposite side one was jaya bachcha jaya bahadri of that time and another was dina tamam they came almost at the same time and they gave a new interpretation of beauty we are talking about beauty but as a matter of fact ultimately what attracts us what uh, uh, makes us fall in love is not beauty but charisma there is a difference there are many models who are much better looking than any leading lady and there are many male models who are 10 times more handsome than any leading man but you don't fall in love with them you get attracted to somebody who is not perfectly handsome is ultimately i mean would you say that amitabh bachchan or rajesh khanna or dilip kumar were the best looking men it's not true but there is something about them and they were something about them so this concept of beauty that the weight should be this and the back should be that and the hip should be that yeah we talk about it and it is good for selling products but ultimately ultimately you fall in love with the charisma you you are there so many young people sit there and they must be in love with many people did you I mean, did you fall in love with the measurements? No! Nobody does. If you are myth, it is going to sell products. This myth has been created to sell products. We fall in love with personality, with people. But Jan, And they are beautiful. And... I'm going to pose a question to all of you which, because Javed Saab is extremely seductive when he speaks and he could be making the opposite point and you would still be applauding. Why don't you tell me before? <laughs> But let me pose a question to all of you who's cheering what he's saying. How many of you here are spending time in the gym, not eating sugar, not eating cake and worrying about how you look? At least put up your hands honestly. Seriously, that's it? <laughs> Then we should never have been having this session at all. <laughs> But I'm really not sure whether this is, uh, whether we're all as comfortable with ourselves as we're making it out to be. And before I come to Mani to talk about how the idea of beauty that we now live with, I know that clothes, Western clothes at least, are not built for the Indian woman at all. I know and I'll be honest that I'm struggling always to fit. I just went day before yesterday before coming to Jaipur to buy a pair of trousers and the shop, I won't mention the brand, said, ma'am, we don't make that size, you know, so <laughs> let's be honest about it. And may, Anuja... May, may I interrupt you for a second? Are we confusing beauty with physical fitness? Physical fitness, yes. Yeah. And it's, it's wonderful that today the younger generation has more awareness or more consciousness towards physical fitness. But that is not beauty, that is physical fitness. Let's not confuse these two things. Sure. And I'm going to quickly bring Anuja and Marie in before we go back into this conversation. Uh, the contention here, Javed Sahib, is of course I don't equate beauty with uh, physicality, but just how much physical fitness has become about deprivation of, of self and of desire, and that's something we need to discuss. Anuja, I wanted to come to you both as a writer and as an advertiser. As a writer, if you can talk about whether the freedom to write about characters without being so contingent on their physical features is really just about the medium. Think of yourself, if you were writing the books that you've written, if they were to be translated into cinema, would you pick an awkward looking person or would the medium then define you to look for someone who's physically, uh, you know, uh, sort of lives by the idea of, of beauty that we now accept? And as an advertiser, how much do you think the idea of beauty that advertisers and commerce and products are, are pushing yes. has permeated into cinema? Uh, well, as an advertiser, I think uh, the thing that everybody preys upon. So, uh, uh, no, as an advertiser and even as a person who consumes advertising, 
I think the biggest uh, and the scariest thing uh, is nowadays that oh yeah we had there was lenient marking right you were allowed to get old and get fat gracefully there was no issue right now beauty is supposed to last a lifetime so you were beautiful at 16 now you have to look exactly the same so when you're 60 years old you still have to look like a 16 year old and that's where the pressure is really really killing nobody is allowed to age uh, uh, naturally in that sense so uh, we, we've created this well, terrible thing for ourselves is this pressure that you have maintain career. You have to maintain all through your life and make a fabulous looking and very fit cops. So as an advertiser, that is, uh, and that's what, you know, you cannot be fair enough or thin enough. Uh, uh, wrinkles are not allowed. This is not, uh, this is just not permitted. So those are the really, uh, that I think is a major change. That aging is just something that does not happen anymore, is, should not happen anymore. Sure, and the other question I asked you that as oh, a writer and if yes, you're writing a right. film. Because if you're writing a book, then uh, if there's a beautiful girl and you say she's beautiful, if you talk about a man and you say he's beautiful, after that you have to then get to something which all boy, I mean, you have to say on third page, page, she's beautiful, he's beautiful. You can't keep saying that for 500 pages of a novel. You have to go deeper. There are layers. But Javid Sahib is saying charisma, personality, inner voice. So all those things come and that's what makes a character attractive in a novel. In a film, sometimes if it's beautiful, it's beautiful. She's very beautiful. That's sometimes enough to sustain it through. So uh, I think that's what happens. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak, uh, take a quote from Naomi Wolf, who said that, uh, you know, she's of course written about the beauty myth and also that this obsession with thinness which I would still maintain has really come to us from the West. I know that 13 year olds today have more athletic boyish bodies. Uh, you know, we as women are attempting to have more boyish bodies than the Indian uh, gene pool is supposed to really allow. Uh, so the thing, and you know, Naomi says that the idea of thinness, the obsession with thinness is an obsession with obedience and that dieting is the biggest political sedative of this century. So how much would you subscribe to that, Marie? What, what has the West done to conceptions of beauty? Interesting. I subscribe to maybe that in part. First of all, just to say, hello, India. This is thrilling to see you, to look out, to see everyone gathered here. You are my favorite country. Let me just say that for the purpose of talking about this, I want to elevate the conversation about beauty, change the dial slightly to think about beauty in the same way that the ancient Greeks did. Remember, in Greece, eros, which we now think means sex and beauty, really meant excellence and the pursuit of excellence. And I must say, growing up, I was lucky in that we grew up in a kind of renaissance in the 1960s where women revered their mind and their excellence and wanted to pursue their excellence and were taught from the time we were in school that classical beauty and the pursuit of this was in fact something was wrong with this and a woman should develop her mind. So I consider myself rather privileged to have had that luck of being part of that movement. Remember, in the 1960s, this is when it seemed like American beauty ideals changed and really drew on for perhaps the, the beautiful women of the, ben, of the Bengali, with, with the lovely almond eyes, you've got Barbara Streisand. I've just been down in Calcutta admiring these exquisite Bengali physical beauties with their lovely coloring and the, the almond eyes and the Bengali poets who revered a different kind of beauty that we think is classically Western. That gave us Barbara Streisand, who became a very influential superstar in my childhood and influenced an entirely different way we thought about what is beautiful. So, you know, I have a problem because we've developed an alternative panel. Uh, we only want to talk about alternative ideas of beauty rather than the homogeneous ones. So I have a real problem on my hands. But, so I'm going to shift dial as well. Marie, I did ask you, and you know, you, you are connected with the, you know, with the purveyors of commercial beauty in America. And if you would just be provocative enough for a moment to uh, help us understand how pernicious that influence has been, not just for America, but also for other countries that look uh, to Western concepts of beauty. We look at the models that stare down at us, we buy those products, 
as I said, it's not just aspirational, it's low self-esteem that it is, uh, you know, so can you talk a little bit about sure. that? Is there no discussion about this in America? <laughs> Uh, there's a tremendous discussion about it, particularly in the schools, because it seems like we, we're in a kind of a retro time in America, where the 60s ideals of you are what you are and, you know, everything is beautiful and all different kinds of things seems to me, again, being redialed. Again, are we afraid? Is this a terrified culture? But you see the pressure. You see what, you, girls being bullied. You see girls starving themselves. You see anorexia. You see all kinds of issues which... I hope America and the West does not spread to India and to the East. Okay. Javid Sahib, I wanted to come back to, let's discuss the idea of beauty that you subscribe to. You know, as you said, it's charisma. Let's move away from physical beauty. Can you talk about Indian literature? What for you are towering characters that would, you know, evoke the, the word beauty in your mind, whether they're male or female, uh, literature or cinema? Can you pluck out some actual characters? No, first of all, let's don't get away from the physical beauty. That's equally important. Uh, why should we do that? I told you, you are clapping on the other side as well. But, uh, <laughs> no, no. But uh, what is the idea? I mean, th there are two realities which are almost uh, contrary. One, I mean, sorry for repeating this cliche that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. That is also true. But then on the other side, there is there are certain things or certain people who are beautiful and if you say they are not something is wrong with you. We can't say Taj Mahal is not a beautiful looking building. We can't say Ajanta's paintings are not beautiful. We can't say a sunrise or a rose is not a beautiful looking thing. So there are some universal realities also about it that this is beauty. But on the other side, the fact is that if you fall in love with somebody, that person is the most beautiful person in the world. So, I mean, you know, it's a contradiction. But that's how it is. Now, what Shashi said in the beginning is so very right. That the advantage literature has, that if you are, I mean, I have seen the film Dracula. Sorry for changing the topic. But <laughs> and I have read the book. Now, in the film, you have sound, you have visual, you have effects, you have faces, you have the set and everything. While in the book, you have only words on a paper. But the kind of fear the book and the kind of eerie feeling the book gives you, the film doesn't give you a spite of all that. The kind of beauty you can see in a book is not possible to see it on the screen. Because when you are re reading about Paro or about Anarkali or for uh, the heroine of Gone with the Wind or uh, Madame Bovary, actually you are making her face, you are making her physique, you are making, dressing her up. So ultimately that is not Paro, that is not Anarkali, that is the extension of your own fantasy, it means the extension of your own self. And nothing is more beautiful than yourself. <laughs> so, Nandana, before I... <laughs> Nandana, before I come to you, Javit Sahib, I'm going to ask you a direct question. Acha, these were many questions. These were... You, <laughs> you turned... Okay. You, I'm free in the evening. <laughs> You turned them into indirect questions. Are you um, approving of Katrina or Karina's attempts to arrive at size zero? Yes. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. Do you call that physical fitness? Yes. These are fashions that come and go. You know? And what happens? These are fashions. Javits have made you stumble? You yes. You know, at any time in history, we have always admired the successful and powerful and we, and most of us and many of us at any time have tried to overrate them. Now, today we have a society that is successful, that is powerful, that is affluent, that is rich. So, somewhere you have an admiration for the position. And whatever they do, many people would emulate them. 
but this is temporary, it will not stay. In any case, in an undernourished society, a thin woman cannot be very beautiful for a very long time. In fact, uh, you know, Shashi, that's the great irony that in a country like India, the richer you get, the more you pay to eat less. Uh, you know, where, when everybody else is really struggling mm. to be able to get two square meals in a day. <clears throat> so the question I wanted to ask you, Shashi, is that we're all discussing the fact that literature allows space for imagination. But let's be a little more critical of cinema today. And would you accept that, let's even look at Draupadi or Mahabharata or any of the Ramayan characters. The moment they translated into cinema, look at the kind of gaudy characters, and I don't mean uh, celestially gaudy, but uh, you know, obscenely gaudy uh, characters that we get on, on cinema. What is driving that? Hasn't commerce and cinema in, in the 21st century become almost synonymous? You know? Well, is it course, really yes, but you know, Shoma, there's even something more fundamental, which is that a lot of these depictions violate the actual descriptions of these characters. Yes. I mean, you read ancient Sanskrit texts, and I don't just mean the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata, too many of the characters are described, but you can read the erotic poetry of Lavaha Chandra, Bhavaka Devi, whatever. You find women described as having rather ample proportions, uh, big breasts, an elephantine gait is actually praised. She walks with the majesty of an elephant. I mean, these are the kinds of things that were seen as ideas of female beauty. Go look at most of our temple sculptures. I'm sorry, you won't find the Karina passing muster on a temple sculpture. <laughs> so the truth is that the, the 21st century internationalized idea of beauty is parked there to substitute for an authentic Indian vision. Draupadi, by the way, was dark. One of her names was Krishna because she was actually a dark person. Have you ever seen Draupadi depicted on television or on the screen as a by dark actress? I mean, the fact is that we are now, this has become the land of fair and lovely and God knows what else. I mean, uh, there is, uh, uh, in, in our, when I was, even when I was growing up, healthy, that somebody who was fat was called healthy. Uh, somebody who uh, uh, seemed to have a considerable amount of body weight was considered prosperous. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, today, the very qualities that in our society, perhaps because we were in uh, a society where food was expensive uh, and difficult to get, where nourishment showed that you had affluence enough to afford that, for many people, the largest single item of their expenditure out of their salaries every month was food. And so, having surplus of it was a sign of success in life. All of those suggest that we were a society that in many ways privileged the plus size woman and not the zero size woman. I think Karina is lovely by the way, but I think she'd look a downside better with 10 or 12 kilos more. <laughs> you know, again, again, as a matter of fact, on a serious note, it is totally understandable. In a society where there is a problem of nourishment, the food shortage, a person who is plump is symbol of affluence yeah. and containment and beautiful. There is something wonderful about the person because the person is plump. So it is totally understandable. As far as the fairness is concerned, again I'll come back to the way we are today thinking of uh, size zero because it is acceptable in the West and the West is doing well. So obviously size zero must be right. Same way, I think we have been ruled by different people like say Iranians and then Afghans and then Mughals and then uh, the Britishers. These people were fair people. These, uh, besides Britishers, these people were from Central Asia. So fair accomplishing people. And then came uh, Englishmen. They were fair accomplishing people. So because the ruler for almost a thousand years were fair accomplishing people, fairness became the virtue. Otherwise, if we take our own literature like uh, Banchikatukam or Shakuntalam, there the description of woman is exactly, as a matter of fact, he has been very decent about it. It's slightly more than that. But they, they are not talking of fairness. This is an imported idea, it's a colonial uh, mindset. And now, this is via satellite. This colonial mindset <laughs> comes to us via satellite. In fact, uh, I, I would suggest that ever since we've opened the economy, which is around 1991, is really when ideas of beauty have changed, even in cinema. 
and which is again to reinforce my point that commerce, the incoming of, uh, you know, beauty products did affect the way cinema particularly uh, presented beauty. Movies started to be made for NRI audiences as well for the first time. Yeah. And the NRIs had the Western conception of beauty because that's where they were living. Yeah. So just to shift away from physical beauty, Nandana, can you pick a character? Uh, you know, I'm repeatedly asking this because I'm hoping uh, one of you will pick some towering character and tell us what are the qualities that, you know, you would have called beauty, you know, beautiful character. Um, the character that uh, uh, immediately comes to mind is not an Indian character, but uh, archetypal, is in fact someone who is described as not being particularly beautiful. And it's um, Elizabeth from Pride and Prejudice, who is, uh, who is liked for her intelligence, for her wit, for her sense of humor, um, for her feistiness, uh, for, indeed for her pride. But the interesting thing about her is that when she, I mean the whole kind of fight between her and Darcy starts off because she overhears him say, uh, talking about how she is not very handsome, uh, she's not very pretty. So, I mean, again it's interesting though that when that became a film, one of the most beautiful women of our times was, was chosen to play that part and she did play it very beautifully and in fact she uh, brought many nuances uh, to that character but I think I see uh, beauty as a much more kind of holistic um, thing that comes from within you. Marie, you spoke of uh, some of the women and the women's movement that you grew up with, with the Renaissance ideas of beauty. Again, can you pick a character either out of cinema or literature? Absolutely. I, could, I would like to throw in an idea of a painter, Frida Kahlo, who helped reconfigure the, you know, the great Mexican painter who had her eyebrows grew together. She, was, uh, at, at, she was, became uh, crippled later in life. No one would say that she was a classic idea of beauty, except, of course, in the movie, as Nandana said, who plays her, wasn't it Selma Hayek? But Frida Kahlo helped define what a woman could do, again, despite how she looked. And of course, she was with you know, one of the most charismatic painters in the world, Diego Rivera. And to add to that, that when she chose to uh, do portraits of herself, she painstakingly um, painted her, her facial hair, all of her facial hair, her uh, slight moustache and her, I mean, it, it's actually, that's a fantastic, a very inspiring example. So, I'm here, so, you know, we've been away from you for a long time. Um, in the advertising world, you know, did you feel this kind of silent violence yes. uh, that the ideas of beauty was perpetrating on society? Yes. Did you ever get any sense of feedback on that? Were there user surveys? Was there a kind of cynical approach to that construction of beauty? And again, if I may ask you the opposite question now and pick some of the really egregious examples of beauty as oppression uh, from current cinema. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. There is a lot of pressure in, in the marketing world, especially in uh, you know when you have uh, when you have meetings before a sh uh, uh, an ad shoot happens, and that there is this pressure, spoken or unspoken, to cast someone who's fair, to cast someone who has a classic features. Everything we've been talking about that that kind of woman. We have instances where you know there's an ad maybe for a, a detergent, and that is supposed to be a woman who's playing a mother to two young children, and that girl is the girl we casting 16 years old, and then you sort of, you know, you put grey in her hair and stuff and you try and make her look older. So again and again it's really worrying. Even a lot of the films that we see where someone is playing de-glamorized character hair and all that kind of thing, they always start off with a fabulous looking woman according to what is the current concept of beauty and then you go on and say, look, she put on so much weight for the role or she didn't wear any makeup and stuff but everybody knows the very comfortable assumption at the bottom is that this girl is dropped dead beautiful according to the cookie cutter format of what is beautiful and then we're just adding on a little amplification therefore, you know, uh, we're trying to be politically correct about it which is very frightening and very unreal and what really worries me is that a beautiful woman is not allowed to be powerful a beautiful woman is not allowed to be intelligent. A powerful, beautiful woman is very, very threatening and always ends up, you'll see this in media and everywhere else, that if she's beautiful and she's powerful and she's intelligent, nobody likes her. That's the way it plays out. Okay. media. <laughs>
Javits app that's getting tweeted across the world. She said, if you're intelligent, beautiful, and what was the third one? Not allowed. You, uh, intelligent, beautiful, and powerful. You know, and Javits app said, who is she? As though she doesn't exist. <laughs> no, no, no. I wanted, I wanted an introduction. That's all. <laughs> okay. Uh, I asked you, uh, but let me ask you, Shashi. Give me a bad example from cinema uh, that you know. For instance, with with the wife of Bath from Chaucer. Uh, you know, a really rambunctious woman make it to cinema today, you know. Can you think no, of any character think, like that? No, but the point is I don't think that any of those would play because as Mary pointed out, even Frida Kahlo, who was no epitome of physical beauty, had to be played by Salma Hayek, one of the most beautiful actresses of our generation, because people are not going to buy tickets and spend two hours of their day watching somebody bad looking. It's as simple as that. So that when these people are casting actors and actresses, uh, and it applies to both genders, they want people who are pleasing on the eye because that will put bums on the seats. Let's be objective about it. It is purely commercial. <laughs> and that's why I think there is a danger to some degree in the self-reinforcement between the image that the marketers, the producers, the filmmakers, the, the commercial makers, and so on, uh, project and uh, because they believe that's what the audience wants to see and what the audience persuades itself is the epitome of what they want to see. I think Javed Sahib was quite right to point out a little earlier that we've had alternative depictions. But there was always something attracted to Jaya Bhadari, the young Jaya Bhadari was cute and that cuteness appealed to a certain instinct in the male audience who went to flock to see her anyway. Uh, in other words, not every form of beauty has to be shall we put it bluntly, uh, lust-inducing beauty. There can be beauty that evokes other kinds of feelings that would also induce a person to watch an actor or actress on the screen. So let me ask you an unpopular question in a literary festival, which is, you know, we gave the politically correct positions before this about the power of literature, but today is literature really uh, shaping public consciousness in any way, or is it really only cinema? Well, I think it's certainly... Um, uh, it's still there. I mean, See, you you this festival, you're the answer to that question to some degree. You're all there. Um, I would say that the segment, the percentage of people who read frequently, devotedly, is definitely shrinking. And the number of books they read is also shrinking. I myself am an example of this, but perhaps the circumstances of my life are relatively unusual. But for most people, you have so much more else you could be doing. Just 25 years ago, in India, when television was not widespread, when computers hadn't been invented, when <laughs> mobile phones and handheld games and so on weren't there, if you wanted leisure, you found it with a book, or you went to the movies. Those are the two options. Today, you have so many other outlets that even if you are a reader, you're also sometimes doing one of these four or five other things. And so there, it is there, but it's a much smaller percentage of the popular imagination. And that's one thing, one, you know, for example, it's striking, I was reading something about how in 19th century, an Indian traveling to England could instantly enter the frame of reference of a conversation, provided he knew the English language and had read English been educated, because everybody around him had read the same things he had read. Today, you can't do that. We're supposed to be this globalized world, but absolutely not. The Indian or the Bengali is watching a different television show from the Malayali and neither of them is watching the same show that the American is and when they meet they don't have books in common to talk about anymore they actually have these different uh, these different so things Shaki, so I, that absence of universality is also a problem Nandini I wanted to ask you a question you know which is uh, two questions really and I'm going to come to Marie for that but you know you uh, did do a scene of nudity in one of your films and this thing that Shashi just said about it reaffirming you know because of the way beauty is being constructed that we as viewers are both the drivers of that as well as that driving us and you know reaffirming our ideas of beauty. Very often I find people I would never imagine uh, you know talking about fatness saying oh look at how much weight that actress has put on her XYZ. So my question to you is that if you know and you are possessed of a very proportionate uh, body figure you know what Pythagoras or Plato would have would have spoken so about. the five health statistics. Okay <laughs> but if if you had had ungainly uh, roles of fat would you have had the courage to play a nude scene? Um, you know I have 
I probably would. Um, I have to be absolutely honest with myself and say that I have not ever been asked to do that. So it's very easy to take an ideological position and say, yes, of course I would. But if I were actually faced, uh, facing that uh, situation, I don't know what I would say. But since you're talking about, you, you brought up Rangrasiya, uh, and since we're talking about how uh, there are pressures on uh, being beautiful in a certain way, incidentally, just an aside, I think there have always been pressures, because when I was listening to everybody, the pressures may have increased, but throughout time, uh, they've always, there's always been uh, an ideal of beauty, right? So Hema Mali, when she entered the industry, was told that she was too thin. And at that time, everybody wanted to look like that. So I, don't, I think there's something about the way film represents beauty that puts a lot of pressure, uh, especially on women, now more and more on men as well, uh, to conform to the mainstream notion of beauty. But coming to Rangasiya, I was playing a historical character who had been represented uh, you know, by the river mine, all of these paintings. So I actually had to gain uh, 10 kilos, I was supposed to, but I gained 7 kilos. And Ketan was very insistent that I, that I do that. Interestingly, the film that I was doing right after that was an action film called Prince, in which I was uh, a biker chick wearing leather and having ta tattoos all over her body. So not only did I have to lose the gain I had weight, I had to lose some more weight because of what the film was. And it, I remember thinking then that how uh, fascinating, fascinating it was that I had to go through this rather dramatic uh, process of losing weight very quickly because on the one hand I had been playing someone who was the seen as the you know, ideal uh, painter's muse and uh, ideal beauty in some ways and then playing someone who was seen as sexy and beautiful in the most current sense. So Nandana, you mentioned that, uh, you know, that we are now also putting this pressure of beauty on men. Hmm. And that's a question I wanted to come to you with, Marie. It is true, in India now we're also shifting this whole pressure of the perfect body onto men. Uh, and you know, they have nude scenes and they are arising out of the ocean with glistening bodies and eight pack muscles. And I just wanted to share a little incident with you. Talking about violence and self deprivation as opposed to fitness, one of the superstars, one of the Khans, I happened to be walking to his house when he was in his gym. And I heard this sound coming out of the basement of that entire building. And it was, there was this voice saying, Ma! Ma! <laughs> you know? And it turned out to be one of the superstars working out at the gym. So you know the cost at which that eight-pack body comes. So Marie, is that regression that we are making now men suffer the same as women? Or do you think that this is finally parity amongst the sexes? And is some of that happening in Hollywood as well? This is probably called the third sex. The, the equality of the, the, the all exquisite body, the third, the third sexuality. Um, it's very interesting right now in India, I've landed in the middle of this roiling debate about the Fair and Lovely campaign, which has been going on at various periods since I've been coming here for the past decade. But it's so incredible how the Fair and Lovely, which I think they're, a new campaign and a new entirely new skin cream should be developed called Dark and Lovely to really bring India and America into the modern world. Here you have one of the greatest beauties, uh, Lakshmi Menon, the supermodel who's at the Jaipur uh, Book Festival this weekend. She works in Paris, she works in America, but she cannot get as much work in India. And she's been a great activist on this. So back to this question about the men, I think that men in India and as well as in America, which it doesn't quite have the same pressure on the skin tone because you know, as I say, that we're a much more multicultural idea of beauty right now in the West. But there's this extraordinary moment where why is this still happening? Why isn't there a great surge in, in this country to have like a dark and lovely campaign that will uh, take over and put fair and lovely out of business? Absolutely. I'm going to open. Sorry, I actually thought that had happened when this uh, new song came out, and I thought that was what the song was. It was Rangde Tu Mohi Gehua. I thought it, that was what it was. Sorry. 
I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. <laughs> but I just uh, wanted to respond to that. And uh, I was thinking about this when Javed uh, Saab was saying that um, about how we've always actually chosen light, uh, made people into stars for their charisma and for their, uh, you know, not for their beauty. But I think there is a gender divide still very much there, where we still uh, choose our heroes based on how, uh, based on charisma perhaps, and how well they act, and we choose our heroines initially uh, based on what they look like. And then they are, but I mean, those things are shifting, but they're not shifting enough, I feel, that we can say that we are now in a more uh, sort of gender equal space in cinema. Javits up again just to, because you know you really Can you say something about the six packs? About the six packs? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I really wonder who any star uh, showed this uh, six pack because I'm totally convinced that no woman, women are more sensible people than men. No woman will fall in love with a man because he has six packs. It's impossible. Women are not interested in six packs, that's for sure. And men don't care whether you have six packs. <laughs> so, who are you showing the six packs? I can't understand it. I'm very much interested in six packs, absolutely. You, 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 are you in this? <laughs> the, 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 do you want the blue, the blue one? You, you must, they are very strong men there. Why don't you? What can you say? Ah, appreciate that, appreciate that. I, I always follow things that you say with the audience poll, you know, and then I'm going to ask them another question later. Do you agree with Anuja or do you agree with Javed Saab that... Girls, <laughs> nobody likes a six-pack. Hello? Darvet Disco? No? <laughs> so... We like... Gift packs. Gift packs. <laughs> Speaking of consumerism, yes. <laughs> but Javid Saab, you know, you, you really are uh, the custodian in many ways of the kind of range of Hindi cinema that we have seen. You know, you are, you are you know, an institution. I mean that in every way as a compliment. <laughs> Before you say something sarcastic. <laughs> so, the, the question I want to ask Javid Saab, if you're very honest, does Hindi cinema still allow you to do the kind of script writing you did back in the 70s and 80s? Are you allowed to write a charismatic woman figure anymore? In all honesty, I must accept that I have never been able to write a charismatic woman figure. In all honesty. Most of the scripts that I have written were predominantly male-oriented, but at the same time, I must point out that right from the beginning, even in 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever scripts I have written, the women have been intelligent, they are working women, and they have personalities. In any film, including Zanji or Diva, the mother, the, the girl, for the first time we show a uh, living relationship in Diva, in mainstream cinema, and she had her own mind. Our women have been uh, intelligent, independent people. But I have never written a female-oriented film, except for say Sita or Gita, but that hardly matters. Uh, I one? wanted to add something to that. Yeah. Speaking of women-oriented films, um, I think it's, it, it's a very interesting time because you have uh, films like Dirty Picture, which actually flout the idea, the conventional idea of beauty, um, and you have actresses who are not scared to do that. On the other hand, you have films which are women-oriented that a film like Mary Kong, which is based not even on a fictitious character, but a real person, a hero, who is known for her talent and her achievement, and uh, she is portrayed by one of our most beautiful women, right? So what, what does that say about the tyranny of beauty May in I the industry? One little point you were talking, you had asked her, that uh, can they make themselves grotesque or ugly? Uh, look, uh, Shabana in uh, Mandi, 
Shabana was hardly 32, 33. No, but Javed Saab, that's no, not... No, look at uh, Priyanka in this film with uh, Ranbir, where Ranbir was deaf and dumb. Yes. Mm. Yeah. What was the name of Barfi. the film? Barfi. Barfi. Yeah. Barfi, Barfi. Barfi. She totally demoralized herself. Look at uh, uh, Vidya Balan in this film. Uh, uh, Kahani or that other film. Dirty Picture. Dirty Picture. Dirty picture. Dirty picture. Dirty picture. She made herself what is. But don't you think it's... No, with, with Javed Saab, the, the, the rupture here is that none of those, I mean, Shabana and Madhki is hardly the conception of beauty that any society would uh, subscribe to, you know. So, in a session about beauty, I think the essential thing that we are missing is the dichotomy between beauty and character. If this was a session about women characters, we would be having a different discussion. We are really talking about conceptions and ideas of beauty. And unfortunately, I think it is much more homogeneous uh, and much more violent than we are uh, agreeing to pronounce on this platform, you know. Like you said, I think if you really took a poll test between the way women feel about themselves, whether your racial characteristic, your dark skin, your size, your tallness, whether you're getting into a certain kind of clothes or not, what, you know, I think that all of those are a kind of silent violence that we are perpetrating on ourselves all of the time. And I think cinema has become a, a big uh, part of that violence. Yeah, maybe, but at the same time, you know, you had a Miss Universe, Sushmata Sush saying, she did not uh, read that high that uh, some girls who could perhaps never enter a beauty contest have read. Yeah. So, uh, you, cinema in sales, uh, I agree with you, but the fact remains that you don't become a star, you don't become a heart drop, only if you are good looking. No, so Javid said, yeah, you, this to come back and, you know, maybe attempt to pin you down a little bit is about the idea of charisma that you said. It's true you haven't written any scripts, but can you, uh, you know, tell us a literary character or tell us a real life woman that you think of as being somebody that has shaped your idea of beauty, inner beauty, personality, character, just pick anybody. Who would be your ideal of beauty? There is not one single person, there are many. Sure. And exactly. believe me, I am not trying to be humorous, I am not joking, I am not flattering. One of them is you. <laughs> Honestly, I mean it. <laughs> How to leave a moderator speechless? Ja <laughs> Javed Saab is, is playing for time to quickly think of the people that he really wants to pick. <laughs> But you know, Shoma, I can just say Thank you, there are various ways of looking at beauty and that's why it is impossible to reduce it to one. In fact, I, I would say without trying to be politically correct, one of the most beautiful women I've ever met is Mother Teresa. I mean, she was not physically beautiful, but there was an inner beauty that radiated through. Yeah. And the book about her by Malcolm Margaret was actually titled Some, Something Beautiful for God. Yes. I mean... The beauty was the word that occurred to him in talking about this person. So I think, I think you can say that there are various kinds of beauty. We've all seen beauty in the face of the beloved, as, as, as Javed Bhai said. You know, you, you, see it, you see beauty in your mother, in your grandmother. Uh, you will see, I mean, I'm speaking as a, as a man, you will see beauty of various kinds in various people. And let's celebrate the fact that there is so much beauty around us, that it exists in so many different kinds of people, so many different kinds of women and girls. And, and, and may beauty prevail. You see, okay. there is a difference. There is a difference between a beautiful person in an ad or a uh, ad film and in real life. Because when you talk to the person, when you hear the voice, voice also matters a lot. However good looking a person may be, the person opens the mouth and has a very funny voice. You won't like, you won't like the person. You then the IQ, if she is dumb or he is dumb, Within two minutes, you will get over the beauty. Within two minutes, you will be put it out. There's, there's many factors. I mean, selling products is a different game. The real beauty lies somewhere else. Uh, I, I was uh, asked not to allow the audience any questions because there's no place to go through. And, uh, and I've been asked to end the session. So maybe if there's the first person to put their hand up, and that was you, can you ask one question and we'll close this. Time is up. Very quickly. 
Hello everyone. My name Hold is it close. Just, just a question. Just the question. Yeah. Just a question. I want to ask: Is Bollywood is losing its beauty of cinema, as it's like lacking its uh, writers? We have uh, remakes of South Indian movies and Hollywood movies. Can't we have uh, our original writings, original write-ups? Where are our Indian cinema writers who were uh, present sure. in the 70s? Sure. I got your question, Javed Sir. That's the last question. Lob to you. That. Are we getting enough original scripts for Hindi cinema today? Yes and no. I'll tell you why. Never at any time we had such a variety of stories than what we have today. The kind of film. We are making different kind of film. And never at any time there was such lack of depth in our stories that we have today. So on that note, but before we wind up, I want to recite four lines to you because this talk of beauty and don't quote poetry is not done. Okay. Rang bhi, roshni bhi, khushbu bhi. Rang bhi, roshni bhi, khushbu bhi. Jis mein sab kuch hai, tu wo murat hai. रंग भी रोशनी भी खुशबू भी जिसमें सब कुछ है तू वो मूरत है देखकर भी यकीन नहीं आता कोई इतना भी खूबसूरत आज क्या बात अब आई एम रियली सॉरी आई रन आउट ऑफ टाइम द ऑर्गेनाइजर्स वांट अस टू स्टॉप थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर बीइंग योर Personally speaking, I think we weren't subversive enough and we didn't choose real ideas of beauty that break the mold. Uh, but thank you all of you for being here and for participating in this. A big round of applause for Javed Saab, Nandana Sen, Shashi Tarur, Shoma Chaudhary, Anuja, Anuja Bay, Mary Mwana. <laughs> A big round of applause. Oh, I see.